Hello, and welcome to the Royal Automobile Club on um, Pall Mall for this talk show in association with Motorsport. Joining me today is uh, Sam Canal, our staff writer at Motorsport. I'm Jack, the digital editor, and we are with a man who's driven just about everything and everywhere, I think, uh, David Hobbs. So, welcome. Uh, welcome to you as well. So, uh, thanks for coming all this way from Florida. So. No trouble at all, just... A few thousand miles or so yeah. between friends. <laughs> and you're here uh, to promote your book, Hobbo. I am indeed, published by Evro over here in the UK. And um, <laughs> now that was a long book. <laughs> I mean, I did the Le Mans 24 hour race 20 times. Um, but that was nothing compared to doing this book. My wife has been thinking I should be writing a book for many years. And um, so I thought about it for about 20 years, and then it took about 10 years to actually get it finished. Right. And um, uh, myself and Andrew Marriott finished it off. But I actually started with one of my co-commentators from the American TV, Bob Varsha, and we started up literally about 10 years ago. So. <laughs> but I must say, it, it looks a lovely book now. It definitely does. It's, yeah, like I say, it's, it's long, it's thick. <laughs> yes. And lots of personal photographs in there as well. How, was that difficult, easy, en enjoyable, going through those? Well, no, I mean, it, it was fine. I mean, uh, good fun looking up at those old photographs and seeing them all again. Um, over the, unfortunately, we've moved twice in the last few years. We moved from England to America in, in 2002. I mean, we've moved completely. We had actually moved in, like, 1990. But, um, and then we've moved house in America. So <laughs> pictures kind of got, you know, photos and things. And I was a hopeless filer. Uh, filing is not my big thing and so stuff got separated scattered around in storage so it took quite a long time to find my photos Andrew Marriott had some photographs and then of course we went to people like LAT and yep. the Rev Institute for the, for the rest yeah one thing that always surprises me when I look at these sort of books of uh, the same with Brian Redman's book. Uh, the <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I think it's, I think he think lives quite close him. to you I think, I think I've heard of him yeah, yeah. I think how do you guys remember all of these stories the, to the day of these stories? I can't remember what I had for breakfast. So. <laughs> well, everybody says I've got a good memory, but actually my memory is dreadful. Um, I, a lot of it was Andrew himself looked up a lot of stuff. I right. mean, he's a good researcher. I'm not a good researcher. I'm not a good researcher. I'm not a good filer. Um, but I do tell good stories when I visit things like car clubs like Porsche and BMW or Ferrari in the States. And they're also a big catalyst to the book. You know, a lot of them say, why don't you write it? When are you going to write a book? When are you going to write a book? So some of those things I can remember very clearly. Right. But there's a tremendous amount of stuff I just can't remember at all. And um, I apparently drove an LM Ferrari in something <laughs> like six or seven events. I remember two of them. Other, other than that, I can't remember anything at all. Wow. So, um, But it, it has worked out pretty well. And as I say, you know, when I had trouble, Andrew came to rescue very well and um, found a lot of stuff, researched results, looked up all my results, which I never thought of doing myself. Right. Um, and um, certainly not enough first in there for my liking. <laughs> <laughs> so talking of first, um, Morris Oxford, not the, not the obvious choice. Well, um, <laughs> my whole racing career was not an obvious choice because my Mother and father weren't the least bit interested in racing, although I was very interested in Sterling Moss when I was a kid. And um, and Jimmy Clark, when he started to come on the scene, impressed the hell out of me. Uh, but I did like going fast, and um, I had a scooter, a Lambretta scooter for my 16th birthday. And I soon, and I drove that absolutely flat out and wore the f whole foot thing off, you know. And so I then swapped that in and bought a five-year-old Triumph Speed Twin, uh, which was much quicker. And me and my girlfriend at the time, Mara um, Mags, who was still married after all these years, um, we used to hair around the Warwickshire countryside. So then I really thought seriously about racing the bike. Then I had second thoughts about that. Um, but Dad was an inventor, and he had a very small uh, factory in Lamington Spa where he made, he, he invented an automatic transmission, which was probably, well, not probably, it was the best automatic transmission of its day. It had four speeds, didn't have a fluid drive, it had a friction clutch, so it didn't have much power loss, uh, negligible power loss. Um, it was a bit heavier than, than a regular four-speed. Um, 
and he was doing experimentation and a tremendous amount of people had prototypes BMC Midland Red Buses a, a train company had one on a, on a shunt locomotive right. cement trucks um, just about everything you could think of BMW Fiat um, all had prototypes and <clears throat> luckily for me mum's car was the old MO was the old MO Morris Oxford which was a side valve right so it wasn't exactly endowed with a lot of horsepower. <laughs> and I was an apprentice at Daimler, yep. and then I became an apprentice at Jaguar because Jaguar took Daimler over while I was still there. And the old man had it up at, up at his factory, he had a, a B-series engine, overhead valve B-series engine, a BMC B-series engine. So um, with the help of the mechanics at the, at the, at the shop, we were able to change from the side valve, so at least I had an overhead valve. And I went to the Parkside Garage in Coventry, which is the big BMC dealership, and I bought uh, an MGA manifold right. and put that on, and then I got two SU carburetors from Daimler. I don't think I paid, but anyway, I got two SU carburetors from Daimler and modified it, and then the old boy at the pipe bender, you know, Daimler, of course, was a very old factory, um, and they had this workshop, which was unbelievably full of smoke and... It was where they used to balance the fly, the fluid flywheels. Right. Yeah, they put hot wax in them, and you skimmed it off till it was level with the veins. And then you'd balance it, and you'd drill the, you'd drill little plugs to put lead in, just like wheel weights on a, on yeah. a tire. And this old boy, <coughs> he made exhaust pipes for about every dame that was ever made. So all through this shop were all these coke braziers glowing away all day, and he'd have exhaust pipe, you know pipey in there and he'd yep. bend the pipe so I thought it'd be a good idea if old Bill made me a racing manifold so we made a manifold which actually miraculously fitted so I had a really rorty car made a lot of noise which was very important um, I don't know what mum thought when she was going downtown on it not much probably but anyway that was my first race car it all stayed on while she was driving around the roads yeah well I had no alternative I could, you know it it wasn't like a proper man, a proper bought store bought right. exhaust manifold. I mean, it was on, once it was on, it was on. I mean, it can't take it. So, anyway, and that was my first race car. Yeah, I drove to Snetterton. And if, there was something about that era. Brian Redman, I think, had a supercharged minor. These days, we have Ginettas and we have little Formula Ford single seaters. It's, just, it's difficult to imagine now a young driver driving around in a Morris Oxford. Or <laughs> I think the closest thing we've got is Nick Tandy, maybe, who started in min minis and has reached the top. I think that's, that's a shame now, isn't it? That well, it's changed so much, really. I mean, the whole aspect of club racing, you know, you go to the SCCA club racing in America, which is where it all starts for road yep. racers. And I mean, every car there is brought in in a covered trailer you know, with benches and you wheel the car out and now you've got a full-scale workshop right there with you at the track. Yep. And it's got racing tyres, racing wheels, and it's a very highly modified whatever it is. Uh, and in my day, you know, I just drove to the track in the car yep. and hopefully drove home. Because <laughs> uh, needless to say, I didn't drive home from my first race. But um, And that's what club racing was all about. I mean... Yep. When I got to the track, of course, the organiser said, oh, my God, I'm Morris Oxford with an automatic transmission. This is not homologated. You'll have to go in the sports car race. So I'm suddenly in with the likes of people like um, Sir John Whitmore and his loads to lead, and XK120s, and, oh, well, of course, obviously, needless to say, where I qualified. Um, and I didn't last long either. But, um, but that was real club racing. Most of those cars in that race were driven there. Um, and, you know, there was a sign writer there who would put a number on. <laughs> Excellent. Because you had different numbers every race. And he'd go down by the door, put a big nine, you know, like, or a big one eight or whatever. And then you'd wash it off. Of course, I didn't wash it off because I'd like to go home with the racing number on. Um, but, um, and they all, all the same. You, know, you arrived, they painted the number on your car, and off you went. Um, so club racing has changed enormously. And, and as you say, Brian, his first car, was he drove a, a Morris Minor, not a Mini Minor, a Minor, Woody, you know, the, yes. the station wagon, which yeah. is what he used every day to sell mops and buckets yeah. for his dad's, you know, chain of shops. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, pretty different now. And as I say, now you go to a club race and everything there is, is trailered in. 
well prepared, got a mechanic. I mean, I, me and a couple of friends, I mean, we did everything. And a mechanic, I, even though I did a five-year apprenticeship at Daimler, a mechanic, I am not. And, um, yeah, so it is very different. And it, it is a shame. Um, I mean, the other thing, I suppose I was luckier than most kids because I had access to a car, yeah. access to an engine, and I was an apprentice, so I had access to bits and pieces at the factory. And, um, and we had a workshop and a pit, so to change the engine wasn't the last thing in the world. But, um, you know, we no question of actually buying a, a car to go racing. I mean, this had to be used. It had to be a multi-use car. I couldn't just have a race car. Yep. Couldn't have done that. But that's also what's difficult to imagine, that your own mother lending you her car to go racing. I don't think I'd be able to do that. I know it's a hybrid, but still. Well, <laughs> I don't think she realised what... She, I don't think she realised she was lending me. <laughs> she knew I'd done something to it because of the row it made. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, I mean, well, we did have, you know, because these were demonstrators, which Dad had, you know, we'd got these cars. No, I wouldn't say we had lots of cars lying around, but we had a green Morris Hospital and we had a red Morris Hospital. And these were basically prototype gearbox, you know, demonstrators and, and test cars. Because, I mean, Dad was permanently testing and changing things on the gearbox to, to try and perfect it. So we had did have transport available, which I guess did make me lucky. But the other cost, of course... I mean, you had to be a member of a club because they were all club races yep. and you had to be a member of the Knocking Sports Car Club or the BARC or the BRSCC or whatever. And then they all asked each other to their events. So you just got to be a member of one. Yep, sure. You had to join the RAC to get your license. And the license was like five pounds. Entry fee was about, you know, two pounds ten uh, in old money. Yep. Um, and the fuel was, you know, half a crown a gallon. So it was not a big expensive thing. When my grandson w was go-kart racing in America, you know, like 10 years ago now, I mean, the entry fee for a go-kart weekend was like, you know, $300. Yeah. And the entry fee for my first race was like five quid. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit of a no-brainer, isn't it? I mean, it, it's just... Those costs of... Esc I mean, obviously, the cost of living has gone up over the years. Uh, we know that inflation has taken... But I think the cost of racing have escalated way above yeah. uh, inflation. Karting budgets are hundreds of thousands now, which is just unthinkable. Yeah. Well, of course, you've got kids... I mean, obviously, go-karting wasn't wasn't the big thing then. I mean, it wasn't yeah. like you know, everybody went go-karting like they do now. You've got to be a go-kart. Then you're multiple... You're a county champion, you're the state champion, the world champion, you're like someone like Fernando Alonso, Lewis Hamilton. Um, all these guys come from go-kart. In my day, everybody starts off like I did, um, just racing a car. Any car you could get your hands on, and if you could race it, you, you raced it. Yeah. yeah. And then from there, you went to a TV shunt at Alton Park. <laughs> well, after Morris, I'd got the taste for it. <laughs> Because I was, <coughs> I was a bit dumb. Well, I wasn't. Was a bit dumb. I am a bit dumb. I'm just generally not the sharpest yeah. knife in the drawer. But I, I, I raced the Morris on Michelin X, uh, and I raced Dad's Jag on Michelin X. Now I didn't modify his Jag because he had an XK140 um, with the C-type head, so it already had the three carburetors on it. And um, I went to Bolton Park to spring meeting, which I just. All I could think about at tech and at work was that I was going to race this Jag. Well, it still had the Michelin X on. And on the last lap, going into Old Hall, it got away from me. And because <clears throat> there was no guardrail, in those days you had a bit of a, a bit of a runoff. And then an earth bank. Yep. And it sort of went up the bank and flopped over on its roof. <laughs> and apparently my dad saw this on the TV. Because there wasn't much TV on racing then, no. but he had already seen it. So I rang to tell him, and he said, yes, I know, I've already seen it. <laughs> uh, um, and then the worst damage done to the car was Mags and I <coughs> set off for home from Alton Park. The same, crashed jag. Huh? the same crashed Jag. The same crashed Jag. Same crashed Jag. I mean, we saw, I don't know what we did, the roof. It was a drop top. Um, <laughs> and um, the worst thing that happened was on the way home, the bonnet opened. And of course, those XK120s had a bonnet about the same length as this yeah. table. I mean, bloody great bonnet. And it opened and flopped over the top of the windscreen. Um, 
somehow we got it tied down. I don't know, found a bit of string or something, you know, um, and got home. But that that did more damage to that bonnet than anything. <laughs> and um, and then Dad said, "Well, you broke it. You fix it." And I was a dame, a Jaguar apprentice by now, and um, a guy that worked in the paint shop, well, it wasn't the body shop. He said he'd do it for me at his house in in Daventry, right? And he had he just lived in a little cow's house or a little garage at the end of his garden. So he did the he bashed out the bodywork in there, and I think I, I think I might have had to buy a new bonnet, right. but uh, he bashed all the other dents out, and and then of course he resprayed it. Well, unfortunately, he had to respray it after he got home from work, which was by the time he got back to Daventry from Coventry it was probably you know about six o'clock, so. It had started to damp, you know, the air had gone damp right. like it does at night. So so this car came out a nice the same blue as it was, but it came out with a matte finish. Right. So it was matte to the end of its life. And um now I now. did modify that car quite a bit and I was, finally got my head together and I went over to Dunlop and, and bought some Dunlop racing tires. Which Dunlop were really good then. I just I can see the face of the young guy who was the competition manager. Um Terrifically helpful young man, and of course they gave all us club racers a huge discount. You know, this is a tire that would normally cost you like fifty quid in those days, um, and we'll sell it either twelve or whatever. And um, so I put racing tires on it. I got a straight through exhaust system, right? Um, and I put disc brakes on it because it was a drum brake car. Put disc brakes on it. Put a tramp anti tramp bracket on the rear axle. Because um, this also had Dad's automatic gearbox, and I actually won some races in that car. It was, it was pretty effective yeah. um, when I'd finished modifying it. And the automatic gearbox got quite a lot of attention from, I think, was it Ford or other manufacturers wanted to use it? Well, it was all very sad in the end. I mean, because it, it worked like a charm in that Jag, um, and there's a big picture of me in Motorsport magazine, uh, two pedal racer, and it was at Woodcut going through um, Madrick. Right. Uh, in a nice drift, even though I say it myself, <laughs> it looked very well p positioned on the road. <laughs> I thought, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, I was had, did have some success in that car, and um, you yeah, know, it was Dad's gearbox had four speeds. It had a beautiful little gear train. It had a friction clutch which was hydraulically operated, uh, and when you're in top gear, you had two clutches, and when you're in top gear, both clutches were engaged, and obviously everything else just spun. Um, as one, um, and it had full manual override. So if you put it in fourth, it was then automatic, you know, just on its own. But you could also override it by going down to third, second, first. Um, and there were certain, there were little holes in these little valves that if, so you couldn't do it accidentally, you couldn't just put it in first. Right. Uh, but in my case, they drilled those out a bit. So if I wanted to go down earlier than you would normally expect, I, I could do it. So, and it was like a sequential shift. I mean, it's just like one, two, three, four, leave it in fourth, and everything would do itself. And then to start, <coughs> instead of dropping the clutch, like a you know, rev it to like 2,000, 5,000, or whatever engine it was revving to. I think, a Jagger, I think that Jag engine only revved to about five and a half. Uh, anyway, you know, you'd rev it to like two. And then I'd just stick it in first. Like everybody else dropping the clutch, it just, the clutch wouldn't, it would slip a little bit, uh, which is what you wanted to do. But of course it made the axle tramp horribly, which is what I put these brackets on to stop it doing that. And then I'd just, just go up and down the gears like, uh, in a sequential way. Um, yeah. So it was, it was a very quick, it was a very quick change. Um, the only disadvantage was it slightly heavier than the standard box. The power loss was negligible. Um, so, and it, it, did quite well, and at that stage, um, Westinghouse Brake and Signal bought an interest in Dad's company because they were very, very, very close to doing a deal with Ford. I mean, we had hundreds of Corsair. Do you remember the Corsair? Yep. And well, early Cortinas. No, yeah. Yes. <laughs> they, I don't think they were around when you were around. <laughs> <laughs> and Ford had given them to all their local dealer managers. And they, these guys just loved gearbox, right? And and the dealers liked it because the, the the smallest Ford you could get with an automatic was a Zephyr, right? <coughs> which was two and a half liter six. Um, 
but they were terrible slugs because they were slush boxes. You know, they had a fluid drive, yep. which soaked up enormous amounts of power. And everybody loved the fact that this didn't take any power, and you could have it on a small car. We had we had lots running around in Ford Anglias, which right. only a thousand cc. So even the old man thought it'd be a good idea maybe to use the gearbox. So we bought he bought an Elite. Yes. So we had a Lotus Elite for 1961, and went straight to and. Le Mans as well. Not in that car. With that car, we started off and we hadn't taken any of the trim out, so it was a bit right. on the heavy side. And then a guy called Henry Lee, who had been a, a mechanic, uh, who, had, who had worked at Lotus, he saw me race at Mallory Park and he said, well, you guys need a bit of help. And he said, no, I'd like to help because I think that you, know, you could have a good deal with this car. So anyway, Henry came on board and I had a chap called Ben Cox who's a friend of mine, who also did some mechanicing on the car. And we had our mechanic from the dealership. He wasn't, uh, who was, he worked there all, he just worked there through the day and didn't help out at weekends. Um, and that car became very successful. We took the weight out, Henry resprung it to take, you know, <laughs> took the weight out and things <laughs> up here, you know, we loaded it back to where it should be. Um, we didn't do any trick like get Barani wire wheels, which is what I always wanted, a little bit wider, you know give you a bit more grip but we couldn't we didn't want to go that sort of length and um we uh, we <coughs> we started we i can't remember where we came in the first few races but we finally won at brands hatch uh which would have been in probably april um and i beat love one which is graham warner's the great the gray and white car yep uh and i beat dad 10 which is less less than and the next week was the Nürburgring 1000 Ks, and we decided to push the boat out and do the Nürburgring. So we get the car in the trailer and flew over on the, do you remember those old, um, what are they called, Sol Silver City or something, <coughs> which was a air transport. Got to Calais, and then of course the friend, no, you haven't got a car now, or we haven't got something anyway. We um, got to Nürburgring, and hey presto, we're in that old paddock there, um, which is like a sort of was those it was a, it was a cobblestone, right. the paddock, <laughs> great. It's just like an old stable block. Courtyard, yeah. Yeah, it was very impressive. Yeah, and about every five minutes it'd be Actong Farlak, and there'd be one something which is a tension paddock, and then then it was a suddenly it'd be this Actong part Farlak, Herr Hobbs, will you come to the office please at once? So, Christ, now what? <laughs> so we go off to the office, and the guy says, "We have had a complaint from one of your competitors." Your car is not homologated with an automatic gearbox. So we're going to move you from the up to 1100cc GT class to the up to 1600cc sports car class. Right. In which, of course, we had absolutely no hope at all. And I was driving with Bill Pinkney, who was a friend of mine, uh, who was racing a Lotus 11 at the time, and he was very quick. And he and I, I asked him to drive. So anyway... Off we went, um, and uh, we both drove very well, and <laughs> on the last lap, because we were racing against those Porsche RSRs, which are pretty hot cars. Yeah. Um, I mean, Sterling was driving one, I think, and um, Joe Bonnie and people like that. And on the last lap, the only one left spun into the ditch, and we won the class. Now, the Germans, being very <laughs> thorough people, <laughs> they're... <laughs> Their prize structure was very formal. Obviously, the most biggest, fastest cars got the most money. Well, the 1600cc sports car was about six classes above the 1100cc GT class, and we got about six times the money. Excellent. So that was great. <laughs> Perfect. And um, so that was our first major international win with the gearbox. Yeah. And uh, when we took it apart back at the, at the factory, you know, you could still read the Mintex on the clutch lining. And so it was a very successful wow. foray. And then... Um, Colin Chapman was so impressed that he gave it to Jim Clark. At the end of that year, um, I finished my apprenticeship. I'm now at JAG. And Lofty England, of course, is my boss. Yep. So I'm often racing Lofty England to work in the morning because we both lived in Leamington. And I'm on my <laughs> motorbike and he was in an experimental, in an early E-type. Right. Um, <laughs> the only trouble was... I was supposed to be there an hour earlier than him, but anyway, it's sort of beside the point. Um, but he was a big fan of mine. Um, I was a terrible apprentice, 
absolutely terrible. And uh, because I was, my mind was totally into racing now, and I had the elite, and um, and I just was a hopeless apprentice. But Lofty was a big fan of mine. He helped me a lot, and he <laughs> he didn't think much of the uh, sort of look of the Jag, but he was impressed by his performance. Right. And he was the clerk of the course at Silverstone for a club race on the old club circuit. We went to Beckett's and then straight down the yep. main runway. And, and uh, I had a terrific race with a DB4. Of course, the DB4 was brand new. And my Jag by this time was like 10 years old. Um, it was a 19, no, it wasn't 10 years old. It was only seven years old. It was a 55. So um, anyway, I beat this guy. You know, we passed and repassed. And, and Lofty was impressed with that. And um, he... At the end of my apprenticeship, he got me a, a deal to drive for Peter Berry, who had an E-Type and a 3.8 Mark II, which I was absolutely just lusting to drive these right. cars. And I came down here to London on the Marylebone Road, went to Castle, signed a contract for 500 quid, which was a lot there, yeah. uh, and to drive for Peter Berry. And our very first race was in the E-Type, was at Daytona, and that was... Uh, at the um, inaugural three hour, the continental three hour, which Bill France was yep. very keen to put on. Which became the 24. Which became the Rolex 24. Yep. And um, I took part in the very first one of those in 1962. So at the end of 61, I finished my apprenticeship, signed with Peter Berry, signed with Castle, got married on December the 16th, and um, had a full time, had a professional drive to go yeah. to. And of course, was was now working for dad as well at, at the factory. So uh, off I went to Florida with the Jack. But previously, back at the end of the season, like in sort of October, um, Colin Chapman had called and said, look, you know, um, I'm interested in that automatic gearbox. Um, could we borrow the car for Jimmy Clark to drive in this three-hour race coming up in Daytona? Well, of course, it's just perfect. So Jimmy and I and Peter Berry all flew over together because in those days, we had to fly to New York. You couldn't fly to Florida. Right. And we had to drive down it. <coughs> and we, Briggs Cunningham, um, a guy who used to work for Briggs Cunningham, his name, I just can't remember off the top of my head. He organized all the transportation of, the, of both cars and getting them down to Daytona. And they lent us a car to drive down. Of course, there was no I-95. It was all, it was down one, what's now US-1. Uh, so there's towns and traffic lights and... <coughs> We got stopped for speeding about eight times between New York and Daytona. Um, and then Jimmy Clark and I shared a room at the Carousel Motel in Daytona. And he drove the Elite and I drove the Jag. Unfortunately, the Jag only lasted about 16 laps. Uh, the fuel pump broke. And Jimmy was leading the class in my Elite by absolutely miles. And he stopped for his one and only fuel stop and the boxy thing wouldn't start. Uh, the starter motor had got fried up and it, and it wouldn't start. So, right. But, you know, to cut a very long story short, as you know, Colin Chapman was a very innovative designer. Um, certainly certainly led the field in his... I mean, he'd certainly be the Adrian Newey of yep. back then. And he thought, you know, that automatic uh, works well because Jimmy Clark had, one, had us put one in his own personal eat for road really? use. And Sterling Moss had one put in his elite for road use. Because Jimmy in those days used to live up in Duns in yep. Berwickshire, and of course no M1 either. So it was a long drive from Berwick to um, <coughs> Lotus down in um, London in those days, East London. Um, and he loved it. Um, and when and Dad's company finally went bust at the end of 1963, um, and we had already built a prototype Formula One gearbox for Colin. And right. It was it was just lying there on the floor of the shop when it all shut down. So Colin was well ahead of the game there because he could see that automatic was a terrific way to go for a race car. Yeah. You did speak about the kind of financial burden that that put on you at the time when, when your dad's gearbox company went bust. And it's interesting to see how much money it actually took to race and keep everything else alive. And you were working for him at the time as well. That must have been quite difficult. 
Well, you know, we were married. We we bought our first house. We had our first baby, uh, <coughs> Greg, and um, and I'd worked for Dad, and I was making about nine hundred pounds a year for Dad, and then I went professional basically in nineteen. Well, in nineteen sixty three, I was racing my elite. I racing very, you know, very any car I could get my hands on, and I was employed by a Midland Racing Partnership, um, which is Richard Atwood and myself. Yep. And I drove David Baker's car, Bill Bradley, me, Richard Atwood were the three drivers. And they paid me, and I made about £900 racing. So Margaret and I had a big discussion <coughs> at the end of 63 when Dad went bankrupt. Well, the, the sh he shut the firm down. And um, sh should I turn professional? What do you think? I'm going to make about 900 working, about 900 racing. Maybe I could make a bit more racing if I did more races and... Um, so for 64, I turned pro. Um, and the reason Dad's company failed was that Ford, at the very, very last minute, you know, Westinghouse Brake and Signal had bought an interest in the company. And they actually had built a factory in Manchester to make 500 of these units a day for Ford. And then at the last minute, it all fell through. And uh, what the hell happened, I don't know. Uh, but... There must have been a lot of muttering in the boardrooms of Detroit. People like Bo Warner and other big automatic transmission yep. companies were obviously pretty impressed with the Armand's gearbox. And then Ford, anyway, it, it didn't get used. And so, um, and then he had done, uh, we were doing a lot of prototype work for Borgward in Germany. And they were very keen on it. They were ter tremendously keen on it. And then they went bust. <laughs> So that didn't come about. And of course, the whole train of disappointments had started back, you know, four years before that, because Daimler <coughs> and Lanchester had introduced at the Motor Show in 1955 a Lanchester Sprite, which was a small Lanchester monocoque construction, very advanced for its right. day, one and a half litre four cylinder engine, and an automatic gearbox. And this was the Lanchester for the masses. And Lanchester had always been a slightly upmarket car like Daimler. Um, and of uh, course, at the last minute, BSA went under. And so he missed out two really golden opportunities you know, uh, Lanchester with the Sprite and Borgward with the Isabella when, when both those companies went under. So yeah. it was a, I don't know how the old man lasted. He, you know, the disappointment must have been just absolutely <laughs> palpable. And, uh, but he did. And, um, so at the end of 63, Margaret and I got a big decision to do, you know, what are we going to do? Are we gonna go, am I going to go back to JAG and work there, you know, as an engineer or, or what? So we decided to do the all what and go racing. And things moved pretty quickly. By 65, you were about to make your Formula One debut, if it wasn't for <laughs> the journey down. Yeah, once again, it didn't seem to end too well. No. We were on holiday at a place called Clay in East Anglia. Yep. And I'd spoken to Tim Parnell. He wanted me to drive his Formula 1 car in the French Grand Prix at Claremont. But there again, you know, talking about the difference between then and now. I mean, the first thing I had to do was I had, I had to go to Heston, which is where Hounslow, Heston, wherever yep. he was, and pick, pick the race car up in my car you know, and tow it down on a two-wheel trailer. I lived in Warwick, and so... We set off, and a friend of mine, Jack Brown, was going to come along, uh, who had been an apprentice with me at uh, at, at Jag, and um, so I put my seatbelt on, uh, and because nobody wore seatbelts in those days, but having been in racing, I decided that seatbelts actually yeah. weren't a bad idea, and um, and Jack said, "Do you put that on?" I said, "You're going to put yours on, so I'm going to put mine on," <laughs> and then we were running down the A40, I suppose. Uh, between Vista and Aylesbury. And coming the other way was a truck, a five-ton laundry truck. And it turned right into a factory across the road. And it stopped in the middle of the road and waited. Uh, so I'm assuming he's waiting for us. Anyway, at the last minute, he lumbered off. And, I mean, we hit the side of that van. Of course, we were doing about 90. Um, we weren't doing 90 when we hit, but um, it... Yeah, I mean, it really tanked this Cortina. Uh, and even with the belt, 
I hit my head on the steering wheel and I broke my nose and my cheeks and my jaw and my arm, my left arm. And um, so I was in hospital for, you know, about two weeks yep. at, um, down at Aylesbury. Because poor old Margaret's waiting for me to get killed in a car accident, in a racing accident. <coughs> she wasn't thinking about car accident. How did you get um, word to the team? Pardon? How did word get to the team? Cause I was, I Honestly, I were. can't remember. Um, and the, the amazing is that Jack Brown, <coughs> his side, I mean, the dashboard all got pushed right back. And when, you, when I went to look at the wreck after I'd been come, come out of hospital, there was absolutely no gap between the dash and his seat at all. How his legs didn't get hurt or anything, I can't imagine. Um, so I don't know how the team got told, but um, at that time, that was the least of my worries. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, and in 65, I was driving that Lola T70 for yep. Harold Young Limited in, in, in uh, East Anglia. And um, I came out of hospital, and about four or five weeks later, we went to Croft and I, and I won the race uh, on my return to racing. So that was pretty satisfying. And uh, But it was very disappointing. I missed my first Formula 1. Yeah. yeah. But then he, a year later, you were with uh, John Wire. And looking at the the people you drove for, you've got Broadley, Parnell, Wire, Penske, Yost, Alexander and Mayer at McLaren. That's some of the biggest names Never heard of any of them. <laughs> How do they all compare? How was who was the easiest, hardest? Oh wow! Um, well, all those good guys are pretty easy to drive for because you know you've got really good equipment. Um, but they all have very high expectations, yep. and you have high expectations of them. Um, the wire car, which I drove in '68 and '69, was probably my first really big. I had driven for Eric broadly and done some testing for Eric. Um, and Eric was very easy to work for, slightly eccentric. A bit, <laughs> a bit like, I don't know about Ad Adrian, not very eccentric, I don't think, but Eric, you know, you, you go to a test day and you'd suddenly realise you've got one black and one brown shoe on. <laughs> and you'd say, Eric, oh, oh yeah, so I have, <laughs> didn't notice that. Um, and Eric was very far out. He'd, he'd have, a, you know, everybody just had a clipboard and stopwatch. And a pencil, yeah. And it, you know, you come in and say, "Well, it's understeering a bit now after we've done that last change." And it pushes quite a bit of stow. And because <coughs> in those days, the driver was the data. Yeah. I mean, there was no other data collection at all. Period. So it was entirely up to the driver. Yeah. So you'd watch the revs going into and coming out of corners, and you know, um, and you had to remember everything. <coughs> um, <laughs> you say it's pushing a bit, Eric, as you go through stow. You look at the sky and. Tap his teeth as pens and say, You sure? <laughs> say, yep. Why don't you go and just try it again? Okay. <laughs> um, driving for Wire, John Wire was um, Paul Hawkins, who drove with me in 68, called yep. him Death Ray because he yep. was very wide and, and very, I mean, he was not a, pe a people person. Um, but obviously, very, very good at running long distance cars. Yeah, uh, and the whole team were good. You know, people like David York, who was the team manager, and um, John Horseman, who was the chief engineer. I mean, they were all very good, very experienced, and it was a great team to drive for. Roger Penske, well, you couldn't get anybody better than Roger because in those days we were about the same age. Well, he's about two years older than me, so yeah. he was only just a little bit older than me, and already he had had a huge reputation. Um, just in a very few years, because obviously he'd been a very successful driver himself. But then, like a lot of businessmen, he'd realised, you know, there's much more money to be made in business than there is in racing yeah. at, at my at my level, sort of thing. So, and of course, <laughs> he's certainly right. He employs something like thirty eight thousand people yeah. worldwide now. And I saw Roger just on on last Friday at Sebring. We went to a Hall of Fame do there, and he and I are chatting outside, and and Capello. Dindo Capello was, yep. was being made, was given the Hall of Fame. So he and Roger are talking outside, and I'm standing there talking to them. And Dindo is, you know, very proud of his Audi dealership in Bologna, <laughs> which he's got, you know, after yep. many years of good service. 
<laughs> he's talking to Roger. Roger says, yeah, well, I got the Mercedes and the BMW and the <laughs> something else dealership in, in Bologna. Yeah, nice town, isn't it? <laughs> so Dinda go, good, you know. So. Did it feel like you were driving more for Mark Donahue, though? Well, Mark was very taciturn. He was a, he was a very focused guy, very driven, uh, huge chip on his shoulder, um, very Irish, uh, obviously Irish-American. Uh, and he did not like the Eng- English much. No. He um, liked you, though. But he did. He used to say, and he used to encourage me by saying, you know, for a limey, you're not a bad bloke. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was the height of accolade from Mark when he said, yeah. for a limey, you're not a bad bloke. Uh, so, um, and he and I, our driving, our driving styles were different. So, and it was his car. Yeah. So he set it up his way. And it was a little bit alarming to start with the first time I drove it at Sebring in a test. Because it had terrific understeer. And um, I said, Christ, it's understeer. He said, yeah, oh, yes, I forgot to tell you. It's got a, it doesn't have a differential. It's got a spool, which is means the rear wheels are yep. no, you know, no differential. So obviously it wants to push out because the, the rear wheels want to keep going straight yeah. on. But, you know, once I got used to it and, and I knew what I was doing, there were new, I knew why I was doing it and it was different. So our times were very, very comparable. Um, my only problem was he was a little bit shorter than me. Obviously, in those days, you didn't have all these great adjustable seats and inserts and all that other crap. So my head touched the roof of that 512 a bit, uh, especially somewhere like Sebring where it bounced around. Uh, and it was, it was a, you know, it was an ideal drive, one of the best drives I've ever had, one of the best teams, one of the best co-drivers. And we never won diddly squat in that car. It's the most iconic 512 out there. Yep. It's the Especially most the famous 512. The tank tape on the front corner. And <laughs> Ta- front corner. Whole bloody car. <laughs> After Daytona. I mean, we were on the pole at Daytona. Just missed the Gulf G- uh, 917 team off no yep. end. When we arrived, David York and John Horton just about had a heart attack which suited me just fine because they had dropped me the year before from driving the 917 um, after two pretty successful years in the GT40. Um, and we were quicker than them and both both of us were quicker than all their guys. And um, we led easy. And then in the middle of the night, there was a huge crash down on NASCAR 3. And um, Mark Donahue slowed up. And some guy we'd already lapped about 10 times ran into him and uh, caused all that tank tape and we came third. We went to Sebring on the pole, leading again, and he and Rodriguez had a coming together. As they did, yeah. Right out of the back. And fun enough, in this year's program for the Sebring 12-hour, just, just last Saturday, there's a long story in there by Hal Crocker about the 71 Sebring. And he explains what he saw of the accident right and it's not exactly how mark donahue saw it but they did run into each other that's, that's uh, the racing driver way though isn't it Where oh yeah i mean you always blame the other guy i mean you wouldn't be human if you didn't blame the other guy yeah. um, um there's a there's a line in his book which has always stood up stood out for me about you which he said uh, i made a note of it. he said um he was worried that you he was worried when they signed you that he was worried that you'd be quicker than him which i think from someone like mark donahue is the best compliment that a racing driver could ever give you, isn't it? Yeah, you can't do better than that. Um, Especially coming from someone like Mark Donahue. Yeah, but but as I say, he was a bit of a warrior. Uh, you know, he he worried that um, he you know, that this, some guy was sweeping the floor and he, Mark, wasn't. Well, he had better things to do with his time, really, but he insisted on doing menial tasks like sweeping the floor. And the fact that here at Sebring, I mean, he insisted on driving the truck down there. Yeah. Because he liked driving the truck. Well... Mark, you should be in a plane when you get there, because, uh, and he hurt his foot actually driving the truck. So, but um, well, it's nice to be thought of that way because the thing is that he and I, the reason I got asked to drive for them was because the year before, I'd been doing the Formula Five Thousand, and he and I had had some good. And then Roger decided he'd do some Formula Five Thousand races yep. in the Lola, and the Lola wasn't as good as the Surtees TS Five, um, but he and I had some pretty good races and. Um, and we came about even Stevens, and that's how they came to ask me to drive for them in the first place. Yeah, uh, and that was kind of off the back of a bit of a couple tricky kind of couple of years for you because you had the nine one seven test. Yeah, with the gear, with the dodgy gearbox, 
um, which then sort of lost you that drive as such. Um, and then obviously Honda pulled out of Formula One as well when you were yeah. about to have a year. Yeah. So that you, you Penske drive was kind of the yeah. ideal scenario for you, wasn't it? It was the ideal scenario because he offered me the three five hundreds, the Indy, the Pocono, and the Ontario five hundred, uh, and I did the I did the, the Indy five hundred. Unfortunately, it was my first Indy, and it was uh, sort of easy, and I thought. Very daunty, but still uh, not quite as bad as I thought it was going to be because the banking was not really that steep. Um, and I was sort of running, I was driving the car that Mark had driven the year before. Yeah. He had a new McLaren, the M16, which had the wing and the front wings. And uh, was a, and McLaren had two, one for Peter Epps and one for Denny Harm, and, and then Roger had one for Mark. And um, we both did literally thousands of miles all through the month without any problems at all. And then, for some reason or another, most on Penske light, they put lightweight gears in for the race. And Mark didn't get the pole. Boy, you never seen anybody look so ticked off when he when he lost that pole to Peter Revson. Because um, he was just in the garage being interviewed by all the press saying, oh, great, you've got a new track, but it's a way new track record. Because <laughs> um, the McLaren was getting on for 10 mile an hour quicker than anything else. Yeah. So Alonso comes in and says, oh, you're going to ruin the race, you're going to ruin the racing, that new car, oh, you're going to ban it. Um, I'm kicking tyres and generally looking ticked off. Um, and Mark thought he got the pole, and while he's talking in the garage, Tom Carnegie, who was a track announcer, like you could suddenly hear his voice saying, and there's a new track record. And Mark went from sort of red face to absolutely white. But, I mean, when the race starts, I mean, he just rolled off into the distance. Yeah. And then the gearbox broke. He parked it down between three and four. In those days, you did, they didn't turn me in. He didn't bother that safety car crap. You know, he just parked it and walked back. And, you know, about half an hour later, mine broke coming out of turn four. And I had just stopped for fuel. <coughs> now, in those days, those cars held 75 gallons of ethanol. So the difference in handling between full and empty yeah. is just absolutely massive um, and the car is significantly more sluggish when it's full of fuel in it. and I'm coming off turn four and a guy called Rick Muth is right behind me um, anyway my car just suddenly makes this awful clattering noise and obviously stops going forward um, so I put the clutch in and I thought I thought the engine blow um, so I'm looking in the mirror thinking where am I going to park this thing because I'm on the outside of the road I've gone past pit in and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? I better just pull down on the grass at turn one. Now I'm looking in the mirror thinking, now where's old Rick gone? Because he was right there. Anyway, Rick, had, when I slowed up, he'd, sp he'd swerved, hit the wall. And then he came in and clipped me just back by the left rear wheel. And uh, we both spun down the track and, you know, neither of us were hurt. And then I ran back to the pits <laughs> across the road. Because, you know, our big fear in those days was fire. Yep. And I just filled it up. So I was ready for the off. Um, I didn't judge the distance between myself and turn four very well. Uh, I must have just temporarily lost my uh, sense of uh, speed <coughs> because when I leapt onto the pit wall, AJ Foyt missed me by about two inches. But um, So that race was over. Um, and then, of course, Penske said to Teddy Mayer, uh, oh, well, we'll have... And, oh, yeah, the March car was parked. Mike Mosey comes along an hour later, clips the wall on the outside, spins down, runs into Mark's parked car and sets fire to them both. So Mark, so Roger had gone from leading, I would have been rookie of the year and I probably would have finished, I don't know, seventh, something like that. Um, and he ends up with two wrecked cars. Yeah. So he says to Teddy, well, I'll have two of those McLarens. And Teddy said, no, you won't, you'll have one. You'll, you'll replace the one you got but we're not going to sell you another one. And so Roger said to me, there's really no point us doing Pocono and Ontario because, you know, these new cars are just so much quicker. You know, there's no hope of winning uh, yeah. with the old car. So, But we carried on with the Ferrari and um, we um, went to Sebring leading. Next race was Le Mans. We go to Le Mans and I think we qualified about fourth which was pretty good because we didn't have a long tail 
like the 917s. Yeah. Um, so then on the Friday, Roger says, we need to change the engine. Ferrari had given us a brand new engine. Mark Donahue and Woody Woodard, chief mechanic, said, no, nah, we're fine with this one. Because all of Roger's engines were blueprinted by Al Bartz out in California. He stripped them all down, rebuilt them, and they were bulletproof. Um, anyway, Roger being the boss, won that argument. So they changed the engine, which was not easy in that 512. Um, put the new one in and gave, lent our engine to NART, North American Racing Team, to, to put in their 512 for Mark, for uh, Sam Posey and Tony Damwin. In the race, we were up to third and looking very, very, very racy. And uh, engine blew up. And Tony Adamwitz and Sam Posey finished third. And when we dropped out at about 8 o'clock or whatever it was at night, we'd already lapped them. So I think, <laughs> could have, would have, should have, but I mean, we, we could have won it. That's, that's quite interesting about the results. And they don't actually reflect the performances in your career all that much. And, and do you think it, you've been given an unfair rap by those numbers? Definitely. Uh, but I'm not a lone ranger. I mean, Chris Amon, you know, I mean, his numbers just yep. don't add up at all. And... Um, that 1971 could have been a fabulous year. Could have won Daytona, Sebring, let's not say Le Mans, let's say on the podium for sure. And we would have won the Watkins Glen Six Hour, and I was the Formula 5000 champion, so it would have been an absolutely outstanding year. As it was, it was pretty satisfactory by winning the Formula 5000 championship, but not the year, not a dream year. Um, not the sort of year that someone like Derek Bell would have had, because he would have won all those races, because he's... <sighs> <laughs> He's got more jam on him than a slice of toast. And, but, you know, that's, that's life. And um, on the other hand, I don't think my racing luck was very good, except that I'm still here talking to you about it. And when I think, you know, I really wanted to be a Formula One driver. And when I look at the Formula One drivers who started with me, yeah. uh, there was not many of them left yeah. by the mid-70s. So... Maybe a, maybe it's a good job we didn't get a formula, a regular Formula One driver. You you also tested the Honda RA three hundred and two after was that after Joe Schlesser yeah. had died. I mean, how did you feel jumping into that car knowing that someone had already had a massive? Well, that's the sort of crazy thing about those days, isn't it? You always jumped in, and you thought, "Well, it's not going to happen to me." And uh, he must have done something wrong. It must have been his fault in some way, shape, or form. Although, of course. So many of the accidents were mechanical breakages yeah. in those days. But no, I didn't feel any nerves about it in particular. Um, but it was a pretty horrible car because it was uh, all magnesium. And the engine was a V8 air-cooled and it was hanging off that sort of structure at the back of the rear bulkhead. So it was a real flexible flyer. So you'd change spring rates by enormous amounts. And it didn't make any difference at all because the car was just flexible. Um, but at the same time, of course, they had the the uh, monocoque built by Eric Broadley, the Hondola, with the V12 yep. water-cooled engine. Mr. Honda was very keen on air-cooled. He thought air-cooled was the way to go. But <laughs> that engine was incredibly peaky. I mean, it only revved to about eight, eight and a half. Uh, and it didn't give any power at all until about seven. So it just you had no power band, so it was very difficult to drive. And... Um, I tested them both at Silverstone a couple of times. And I broke the lap record in the V12 car, which at the time was held by Chris, the aforementioned Chris Amon in the Ferrari. Yeah. Um, so it was a, it, the 12 was a quick car. And um, I went to Monza to do the race uh, with the promise of, you know, 69 yeah. regular drive. And um, unfortunately, the... the <coughs> The Japanese engineers insisted that I try both cars, so I spent a lot of time in the air-cooled car. Then on Friday, he finally said, well, which... Friday might have been Saturday. Which car do you want to drive? And I said, well, if it's all right by you, I'd prefer to drive the, the V12. Now, John was on the pole, yeah. and I was, like, 14th. But in the race, I soon started making up... I climbed way up through the field, and then uh, uh, it dropped a valve um, at about halfway through. Yeah. Um, but that was a pretty good drive. And then um, the following year, they pulled out to concentrate on on the emissions for American cars. 
Sounds very familiar. Hmm? Sounds very familiar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but no. still, to your name, I think you've still got the only Britain to lead a lap on NASCAR uh, at the 500. Yeah. Uh, still the only Britain to win Trans Am. So wasn't all. Wasn't all bad. Mind you, the leading the date on a 500 was, of course, a mistake. Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> in those days, there were no radios. Uh, and when the yellow flag came out, everybody dived in for a pit stop. Right. Except me. So... <laughs> So I led a couple of laps while I stayed out. Was that the 1976 one? Yeah, 76. See, that's quite an interesting race because apparently there was a lot of cheating going on at the time. There was always cheating in NASCAR. Yeah. I'll know that. Allegedly. But allegedly, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Uh, no lawsuits here. But um, in that one, a lot of people were uh, allegedly running nitrous oxide at the time. I don't know if that's... Well, I don't know either. I mean, that year was... A I had got some sponsorship from Coca-Cola through a friend of mine called Mike Bailey, and he'd organised some sponsorship for Coke. And they sponsored the 24-hour with the BMW and the CSL, which I drove with Benny Parsons. Yep. And part of the deal was I'd drive the, th the CSL with Benny in the 24-hour, and then in the 500, I'd have his backup car. Well, we get around the 500 because, you know, you just flat out, obviously, you know, those NASCAR cars. And... Um, I was lapping about 178 in his old car, and he was lapping at about 182 in the new car. And I had this mechanic called Tex, and Tex was not a rocket science tist, <laughs> nor was I. Uh, so I said to Benny, you know, well, I'm sort of stuck at oh, okay, I'll, okay, I'll get in. Well, cause what, <laughs> guess what speed he does? Same as me, 178. And he kind of washed his hands a bit, said, oh, well, doesn't seem to want to go any faster than that. Text was sorted out and walked off. But actually, I came eighth in the 100 mile heat. In the hundred, you know, they have a hundred, there were 100, but they're 125 mile races and 150 now, but they're 125 mile on Thursday. I actually came eighth, which is pretty good for a rookie. So I started on the eighth row. <clears throat> when the race started on the Sunday, the big race, as we came off turn four, because it takes a whole lap to get those things up to speed, really, you know. And as we came off turn four, you know, we're all doing about 180, 175. <laughs> and, I mean, you're right in the middle. I'm on the eighth row. Uh, and you're right in the middle of this pack, and there's dust, and people are scraping the walls so you can smell burning paint, you can smell burning rubber, as they touch, and burning everything. Dust, just massive cloud of dust. And you can't see anything. I mean, you're just right in the middle of this mad pack of machinery which weighs collectively weighs something like you know thousand tons and you're all doing 175 mile an hour in this dusk <laughs> as we came off turn four i thought you know i'm not sure this was just a great idea after all <laughs> that's fair but you you still went back to to michigan well that was that, that was that was that was that was amazing that race at michigan because uh in the 500 the rear roll bar link broke so suddenly the only bar working was the front bar so it started to push like push as the uh, Americans would say and uh, understeer as we would say uh, anyway the right front tyre popped going into turn one and that was basically my it didn't do much damage to the car it didn't do much damage but it did enough that Tex couldn't fix it so later on got some coke sponsorship to do the Michigan 400 and I'm driving a guy called Junie Dunlavy who's out of Richmond Virginia and Junie is like something out of an American film about the Deep South. I mean, chewing tobacco, glasses, little old cap on all the time, very small, very Southern, hardly understand a word he says. <laughs> so I don't remember where I qualified, but sort of middle of the pack. And he had a Ford. Uh, the right. other one was a Chev. Uh, this is a Ford. And his number one driver was Dick Brooks, who's in the 90 car. 90, that's 90 to you and me. Right. In the 90 car, so I don't, can't remember what my number was, but anyway, start the race, and I don't understand it. I'm suddenly, I'm passing people right, left, and center. Um, zoom, past Benny, past, you know, I don't know what, what. Suddenly, there I am, third, behind. The only people in front of me are Kelly Arbor and Darrell Waltrip. Right. And I'm thinking, wow, this is not as difficult as I thought I thought. <laughs> And uh, going, coming out of turn four, I found out how difficult it was because I spun it. And it went round like a top. And it's facing the right direction, slid right into pit lane and stopped in front of the pits. 
Junior Dunlavey looked through the netting. He said, that's the finest bit of driving I ever seen. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, just change the tyres, my good man, and we'll be on our way. You know? Well, when they changed it, that obviously the yellow flags come out, uh, and they changed the tyres. And by the time I get to the end of pit lane, I can realise that the right rear is loose, not done up. So I slowly come around, and that was the beginning of the end. Um, but I'm still humming along, and I'm getting hotter and hotter and hotter and tired and tired because that was the year. I was supposed to drive the Jag over here for Ralph Broad, the big right. coupe. Well, of course, we never did anything. And it never ran, and we only raced it once. And I didn't have many other drives, so I was not in very good racing form, fit-wise. And those races are hot as hell, those cars, you know, because you got that great big exhaust pipe is right under your feet yeah. out of those V8s, and the engine's right in front of the heat in those cars. It's just staggering. And every time I came for pit stop, I said, I realised that Dick Brooks was out because I couldn't see his car. I said, why don't you let Dick take over? He said, no, you're doing fine, you're doing fine. I said, you don't understand. I want to get out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I finished the race, and uh, I'm sitting by the truck after just uniform off to the waist, sweating like hell, hair all plastered all over my head. Well, what hair I had left. And um, old Junie comes to me, he says, boy, he said, boy, he said, I thought you was going to win that thing. <laughs> I said, well, thank you very, very much, Judy. <laughs> and that was my last NASCAR race. <clears throat> Excellent. We are rapidly running out of time, unfortunately. Oh, but we that's good reading. But we do have lots of questions oh. from readers. Um, well, actually, one from Rob Morris simply says, thanks for all your years of commentary in the US. Um, so that's quite nice from Rob Morris. Yeah. Um, Greg Ricks also asked to tell us more, tell, you, tell us more about Buffet Benny. Which I guess is Benny Parsons. Yes, well, I didn't know Benny very well, but uh, he had got a bit of a reputation for eating and and, right. and doing <laughs> a lot of barbecuing, you know, and, and he'd have all his secret recipes, which is really just something you go and buy at, uh, not Sainsbury's, but, uh, you know, yeah. Win Dixie or whatever. But uh, yeah, he had a bit of a reputation. But he was, I mean, he was a big guy, but he was not. I didn't think Buffet Benny was uh, a very fair description of him, really. <laughs> And he was pretty good. I mean, in, in, the, in the CSL, his big thing, he didn't know how to heel and toe. So it was downshifts, you know, just put it into the next gear and let the clutch out again. And so, right. um, but he was not, I mean, he wasn't uh, that much off the pace. He learned a lot at the 24 hours, didn't he? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, we both, unfortunately, that was the year where they got the water and the fuel. And right. we, we suffered from it terribly. And we stopped out on the track and, oh God, it was awful. But. Um, Fulvio Balabeo uh, said, Basically, thanks for helping him at Skip Barber once. Um, you were, you spent a lot of time at Skip Barber while he was there, apparently. Oh, did I? Um, and you made, you made an impression on him. Cemented him as a Hobbs fan. So. Fulvio, send money. <laughs> any, any amount you like. So you're basically the reason he loves the sport. So, oh, good. Which is quite nice. Um, well, there's been quite a bit of that in America with the Formula One. That's, we've been doing Formula One, well, 20 years, about 40 years for me. But... Um, um, and a lot of guys come up to me and say, the only reason I can watch Formula One on TV is because my wife likes you, so therefore <laughs> we can watch. <laughs> no shame in that. No. <laughs> and uh, similarly, Douglas Meese uh, says, you pushed his um, Honda S800 when he couldn't start it once at the uh, 1990 BMW Vintage Festival. And that's another thanks. So well, he can send money too. Yeah. <laughs> that's why my knees are so bad. Yeah. <laughs> pushing his car. But, uh, serious question this time from Stevie Mitchell. Um, about 1973 Cana, when um, you were in the Roy Woods M20. And I think you said that was, from what I could see on our archive, you're the only time you had a good car for Cana. But the way I see that is kind of taking a knife to a gunfight almost when you're there in that. And then you've got Mark yeah. Donoghue in his 917 just... With twice as much power as well, <coughs> one of the, one of the best drives I think I ever had was the Watkins Glen Canam in that M20. Now the year before I'd driven the Lola T310, which was just awful, uh, and I just can't say enough bad about that car. <laughs> and that year it was such a disappointment. Finally driving the factory Lola, and um, <clears throat> it was horrible. So the following year, Roy Woods has got this incredible windfall of money from. Carling Black Label and wants me to drive the Can-Am car. 
and he buys the M20, which had been revved since car the year before. Right. And it was such, it was a, one of the best cars I've ever driven. I mean, it was so terrific. The only trouble was it was about 300 horsepower down. Yep. Um, but at Watkins Glen, I came second to Mark Donahue on the same lap in the, in the uh, 917 10 30. Yep. Uh, and I beat all the other 917s, turbo 917s, and there was probably eight or nine of them. Hurley Hayward, Peter Gregg, Brian, um, uh, uh, Jody Schechter. A um, lot, lot of good cars, a lot of good drivers, George Palmer. Uh, and that car was just peachy to drive. Yep. Um, like, but as you say, at that stage, it was already like taking a knife to a gunfight. Yeah, I guess the circuit probably helped being a twisty tight. Yeah. It must have been quite horrible for them to drive a, some, with such a big turbo. The 917, the, the, the 1030 was good because it had a slightly long wheelbase. The others were a bit short wheelbase for such a powerful engine yep. and such a, an engine that came on with such a huge surge of power towards the end. So, yeah, um, yep. not the easiest car to drive. No. Um, uh, a question from Stephen Gate. Uh, would you say you ever drove the ultimate perfect lap? If so, when and where? Would that have been that weekend? Well, I suppose that would have been as good as any. Uh, another good lap I drove was the last lap in the Formula Junior race at Silverstone in 1963 in what would have been the May meeting, duking it out with Denny Halm in the Brabham. And the gear shift knob broke off my car with about five laps to go. Here's another woulda, coulda, shoulda. Um, and I uh, sussed it out and I was changing up with my thumb and down with my finger. Could just a bit leave, about that much lever sticking up above the gate. And um, on the last lap, I broke the lap record. And I had been, Denny and I had changed positions quite a few times. And um, I knew I could beat him because I knew where his weak spots were. And then obviously when it broke off, I dropped back a little bit because uh, it was a bit disconcerting. And, um, and I caught him up on the last lap, and we crossed the line just a few feet apart, and I broke the lap record on the last lap, so that would have been a pretty good lap. Yeah, that's been quite a, quite a field for me, Junior, in 1963. Huge, I mean, there are probably 40 cars in it. Yeah. And you had Peter Handel, Mike Spence, Richard Atwood, Bill Bradley, Paul Hawkins, Frank Gardner. Yeah. I mean, pretty well anybody who was anybody, and me and Denny were like 10 seconds clear of the field. Yeah. It was one of those races that shouldn't happen. Was that your debut season in yeah. Formula Junior? Yeah, yeah. would be my fourth race only my fifth single seater race because before that I had Jim like Mums Morris Dad's Jack yeah. the Elite it wasn't and in fact in 1962 I went back to Nürburgring with Richard Atwood he drove my Elite with me and Richard had done racing the proper way I mean his dad bought him a car you know bought him a proper car a racing car bought him a Cooper yeah. BMC uh, Formula Junior and they formed Midland Racing Partnership and he said, well, I'm driving for you at Nürburgring. I'll let you drive my car somewhere in the season. So in August, the opportunity came up. So I drove his car at Alton Park. And a guy called Keith Francis was the king of Alton Park in those days. And John Fenning was pretty useful. At, at, and everybody thought, well, you know, you might come in the top five. And um, I won the race. Uh, so I won my first ever single-seater race. Wow. And I thought then, oh, boy. This is the way to go. This is you know all, you don't have all that metal around you. This is this is fantastic. So. Yeah. Uh, speaking of single seaters and good days, uh, Anthony Jenkins, regular listener and reader, uh, has asked. Has said, "I'm old enough to fondly remember you in Continental Formula A. Uh, was Sam Posey ever your equal or better on track or in verbal repartee?" <laughs> well, he's certainly a better writer than I am, <laughs> um, and he and I are about equal on the. Uh, talking capability uh i pretty much always beat sam so uh and i think he'd be the first to admit it that um because he was the king of lime rock and the very first time i raced because he lived there and the first time i went to lime rock i beat him so uh he's had to swallow that <laughs> <laughs> i see in your book you did add him in your list of uh best co-drivers so yeah was that how and was he wrote the forward to the book too so. yeah <laughs> Because your rivalry was kind of hammed up a little bit, you said. Oh, very much so, yeah. So it was hammed up by, um, yes, very much by the PR firm that uh, Rod Campbell, who ultimately became PR boss for Ford, and right. has done very well. And Rod Campbell is Townsend Bell's father-in-law. Right. And Rod was a terrific uh, promoter. 
and he dragged me and Sam all over the country to promote the Formula 5000 championship in the, in the mid-60s. Like boxers, uh, mm. like boxers, effectively. Yeah, I mean, he'd take us to, if the race was going to be at Laguna Seca, he'd take us to Monterey and to San Francisco and maybe down to Los Angeles. And, and if it was at Sears Point, we'd go to Sacramento and, you know, but he did all the PR and we, and we were the only two guys he ever used. Right. And we'd be doing TV and local stations and yeah. newspapers. Yeah. So we... And uh, so to wrap up, um, like now, you obviously spent longer as a broadcaster now, I believe, than you did as a racing driver. So I did. I raced for 30 years, and I brought, I've been broadcasting for 40. Yeah. Now, obviously, some of those years overlap, 10 years of, 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 of overlap. But, uh, yeah, I've enjoyed the broadcasting. It's come to a bit of a grinding halt now with the moving from NBC to, um, to ESPN for the Formula One. But, uh, yeah. <coughs> I've had a good career. Can't complain. And as I say, my racing luck was not the best, but generally speaking, I've had a pretty lucky life. Yeah. Met some good people. Um, had Margaret as my companion for my entire life, actually. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, had a pretty lucky lot most of the time. Yeah. And it's all wrapped up in your brand new book, uh, which I believe uh, we will be selling on our shop as well. So. I sincerely hope you'll be selling it in your so shop. If you, if you do want a copy of the book, head to Motorsport Magazine's website uh, and you'll be able to pick it up there. Um, thank you, David, for coming thank over, you, yeah. and thank you for an excellent hour, hour or so. Thanks, yeah. Sam. Thanks, Alan, for making us sound great as ever. Uh, if you enjoyed that, do share, tell your friends, uh, comment, let us know what you liked, what you didn't like, and we'll be back soon, I believe, with your good friend Derek Bell. Oh my God, so he's always there. It's like a nightmare. Him and him and uh, Brian Redman are like sort of nightmare around <laughs> my neck all the time. We'll let them know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thanks. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, we'll see you next time.